Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Every, every who. <laughs> okay, it's September 15, 2020, the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. Okay, it uh, comes right after the Feast of the um, Exaltation of the Holy Cross of Our Lord. So, it's, uh, it's no surprise, it's no surprise really for us Catholics um, as to why the church in her wisdom has um, put and juxtaposed these two feasts uh, one after the other, right? In the same manner that, you know, just, I'm just reminded of uh, another feast in the church that has mother and son <clears throat> uh, coming one after another. Who can remember what feast days of a mother and son come one after the other? Saint, yes, yeah, Saint Augustine and Saint Monica. Very nice, Mia. Very good, right? Saint Augustine and Saint Monica. Their feasts also come one after the other. But in the case of our Lord, okay. Two feasts, two commemorations that uh, come one after the other between mother, uh, son, and, and, and mother. And it is this, the feast days, the commemorative days that relate to the cross. Relate to the cross. So one feast is yesterday's feast, the exaltation of the Holy Cross, uh, where we celebrated the discovery, the recovery of the cross, and and then after that, the uh, exaltation, meaning, you know, what is exaltation? What does that mean? Vocabulary. Huh? Rejoice. To what? To rejoice, okay? To celebrate, right? To, to, um, to promote, right? To celebrate the discovery and to, and to promote and to hail and to glorify the uh, the uh, symbol of the cross in our lives and the reality of the cross in our lives, especially in our Christian culture. And then right after that, it is really apropos that we uh, celebrate the feast of someone who was intimately connected to that cross besides our Lord. And that is none other than uh, Our Lady. Oh, what is that? There's a little thing that came up on the phone here. The Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. Why? Because Our Lady's life, her entire life, her entire vocation, her entire mission in this world was intimately tied up not only to the life of our lord in general but more particularly to his redemptive mission okay so let us recall the whole purpose right our lord came to this world primarily to what what to redeem us right to redeem us from sin that was a primary mission okay so uh, everything was geared towards that and of course in the course of that redemptive mission was also the fulfillment of the revelation which was began in the old testament and continued and fulfilled in the new testament so of course all of these things are tied up together and part of that fulfillment and part of the uh uh, manner by which that prophecy of the Old Testament was to be made uh, manifest and carried out in the New Testament was the involvement of Our Lady, the involvement of the Mother of Jesus, which has already been prophesied from Genesis. Okay? From Genesis, where, uh, where God told Adam and Eve, or rather God told the devil, the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. 
See? And her heel will crush the head of hell's serpent. So, um, there, right from Genesis, God has already forewarned the devil and prophesied there is going to be a woman involved in all of this whole redemptive mission that I'm about to carry out in the world in the appropriate time. Okay? And so, <clears throat> when that appropriate time came, <clears throat> Our Lady, having been well prepared uh, from, uh, from birth and her childhood, you know, from her birth, she was immaculate, uh, conceived without sin, prepared by her own parents to later accept the uh, invitation from the angel during the Annunciation to take on the role of the Mother of God. And Our Lady wholeheartedly accepted that role, right? And of course, we know the rest of the story. She gave birth to our Lord <clears throat> and then began her participation in that redemptive mission of Jesus by already, right from the birth of our Lord, already experienced certain sufferings certain sorrowful incidents in her life that were all like a precursor to the, to the big one, to the big suffering that she was to endure at the side of the cross. Okay? And that is why the gospel today, we have two choices for gospels to read at Mass today. One comes from St. John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, the other one comes from St. Luke, chapter 2, verses 33 to 35. So we can consider both of these in the light of Our Lady's life. And let's read the one of St. Luke first, where this is a story of the presentation of the temple, where uh, our, our Lady and St. Joseph brought Jesus to the temple eight days after he was born. Right? And there, who did they meet? Who did they meet in the temple? Simeon, Jacob. Simeon, right? Simeon. And what does Simeon tell Our Lady? How is that, Jana? <laughs> what is that? Jana's making some gestures. <laughs> okay, well, good. Uh, let's read it. Simeon told uh, the parents of Jesus, right? Joseph and, and, and Mary. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be contradicted. Okay? Our Lord was a sign of contradiction. And he forewarned Our Lady and said, And you yourself, a sword will pierce. Okay? So there, Jana, <laughs> pierce. A, soul, a sword shall pierce so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So there, Simeon already foretold that Our Lady was going to suffer a lot because of uh, our Lord. Because our Lord was a sign of contradiction and he was not going to be alone in his sufferings. His mother was going to be part of it. His mother is going to be part of it. So very interesting, right? Right from the very beginning, everything was being foretold. And so, and so uh, what were those things that were going to unfold, which at that point at the temple was not known yet, but was going to certainly unfold? Okay, well, let's read up. What are those seven sorrows that we in the church are traditionally um, uh, um, you know, uh, asked to to uh, to contemplate as far as the sorrows of Our Lady, the, the the seven sorrows of Our Lady. Well, the first one is this: the prophecy of Simeon. See, that's the first sorrow. That right there, you know, the, the, Joseph and Mary must have been so happy, right, <laughs> to have their son, and then they were so happy to present him at the temple. So it was great joy. That was, you know, 
uh, enveloping them, so to speak, in their whole uh, in their whole marital life, the beginning of their family life, and all of a sudden, Simeon comes to, well, break that down a little bit and say, "Yeah, well, you know what? I'm sorry to tell you that." This child of yours is going to be a sign of contradiction. And you yourself will suffer. A sword shall pierce your soul. Their enthusiasm must have sunk at that point, right? Those are very difficult words to hear. At the middle, right in the middle of all the joy that they were feeling because of having Jesus and then not too long after that the second sorrow comes what is that the flight into Egypt right where they were told okay get up go you know Herod is after the life of this child you can't be here take off go to Egypt really <laughs> We thought we were going to have a peaceful, quiet life in Nazareth. And, and, and then here you are, angel, telling us we need to go to Egypt. I mean, can, can God even save his own son from the clutches of a tyrannical government? What happened here? But no, our Lord and, and St. Joseph, they just obey. They take things to heart. Sorry? Amen. And Mary. Yeah. Our Lady and St. Joseph. They just, you know, pick up their whatever meager belongings they have and uh, hopped on the donkey and off to Egypt. Right? And there they lived a life of uncertainty. They didn't know what was going, what's going to happen next. But anyway, they obeyed. Okay. Then Jesus grew. Became big boy of 12 and they decide okay it's time to uh, bring him to the temple then he gets lost <laughs> or he decides to stay behind <laughs> and boy could you imagine the the, 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 the the anguish of our lady and Saint Joseph right where is Jesus where is Jesus and then and then they met him three days later back in the temple. And what does Our Lady tell him? Your father and I have been looking for you. Why did you do this to us? And our Lord answers them. Didn't you know I'm supposed to be at my father's house and doing my father's business? What do you mean by that? Maybe Our, our Lady and Joseph didn't quite understand the answer. And, and they just, what did Our Lady do? pondered all of these things in her heart right instead of being sad about it instead of questioning things instead of doubting the wisdom of Jesus at the age of 12 she just ponders these things in her heart and decides I just better try to wrap my head around this Jesus and I uh, I don't quite understand what's going on but anyway I trust you you are God and you want me to go through this and okay, I will just ponder. Ponder means to understand. It means to try to really uh, uh, appreciate the sufferings that she was going through. Okay, At this very early stage of her son's life, 12 years old. Then what's next? Of course, Jesus grew up with them. The gospel story tells us he grew up with them and he was... Erat subitus ilis. Very nice Latin phrase. Erat subitus ilis. What was that? He was subject to them. He was obedient to them. Right? To his parents. See? Our Lord was a very obedient boy. Right? Very obedient boy. Okay. To the point of obeying his father's will that... He would give up his life to save mankind. Okay? And his obedience was manifest all the way to the agony in the garden. Where he told he was trying to uh, negotiate, so to speak, right? With God the Father. And ask him, 
well, you know, should I really go through this? But not my will be done. Eh? Not my will, but yours be done. Our Lord's obedience, obedient all the way to death on the cross. See? That's our model of obedience. Obedient to the parents, obedience to God's will. Okay, he had a lot of practice being obedient to his parents. So when it came to the real big thing, well, he was ready to obey God's will. See? So lesson here for all of you. Don't, don't imagine that you're going to be obedient to the will of God when it comes to big things if you haven't learned to obey in the little things of everyday life. The little things of everyday life. If you don't know how to obey in the little things of everyday life, you will never be able to obey whatever big thing God might bring to your life in the future. Eh? So let's be like Jesus. But anyway, we're talking about our lady's sorrows here. The next sorrow is, well, meeting Jesus carrying his cross on the way to Calvary. Eh? Perhaps you kids would not be able to yet comprehend and appreciate the sorrow of a parent who sees his or her child suffering. Okay, You cannot imagine that. Uh, because you're not parents yet, but I can tell you that the slightest, the slightest suffering that children go through, really parents feel it. They feel it in their flesh. Okay? And I know you cannot imagine this, but take it from me. Okay? Some of you have gone through <laughs> some very harrowing experiences, and your mommy and I, I can tell you... Uh, Yep, we, we, we felt it very much inside of us, what, what you were going through. Okay? So, you, you each know what kinds of things you've gone through, right? Especially the one who broke his head. <laughs> okay, and then, of course, the fifth is the crucifixion itself of our Lord. Okay? The crucifixion of our Lord uh, and and um, and his death on the cross, and that is what the second gospel, the other gospel, relates to uh, to us. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, and the wife of Cleopas, Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there, whom he loved, who was that disciple? Saint John. He said to his mother, "Woman." Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. So that was the, the fifth sorrow, the crucifixion of Jesus. And then the sixth, the body of Jesus being taken down from the cross. Uh, as, though, as though witnessing the death of our Lord was not enough. Our Lady had to endure holding in her own arms the lifeless body of her son who is flesh of her own flesh, blood of her own blood. All of the blood that Jesus spilt all the way from his agony to dying on the cross was Our Lady's blood. Eh? That was our ladies. He took everything that's physically in him from our lady. So you can just imagine uh, our lady carrying the lifeless body of her son to whom she gave the life that he just gave up for the redemption of mankind. I couldn't fathom that myself. It's unimaginable. And it's, it's because we haven't had that experience. And some people say that that's one of the hardest experiences in life. It's to, to bury your own child. 
Okay, you have to bury your own child. And that is the seventh uh, sorrow here. The burial of Jesus. The burial of Jesus. Well, uh, personally, I cannot relate to this much because we haven't had that experience. And we hope not to have that experience because apparently it's a terrible experience. So I hope not to, uh, not to have to experience anything like that with any of my children. But trusting uh, the experience of other people, this must be a very, very hard and tough situation to bear. Okay? So can you just imagine, Our Lady endured all of these things. God allowed Our Lady to endure all of these things as a manner of ma really making her a, a very close participant, an intimate part of the redemptive mission of our Lord. So Our Lady plays a very, very special role in our Lord's redemptive mission. And because of that, and because of the fact that she was given to us to be our mother, then she too has a very intimate role in our own redemption, in our own sanctification. That is the connection there. That's the connection. And that is why Our Lady has a very, very special role to play in our journey towards heaven in our life of sanctity because our life of sanctity is nothing more but being beneficiaries of the redemptive mission of Jesus we were our beneficiaries of that and therefore we are beneficiaries of our lady's own contribution to that salvific mission and to that sanctification of the rest of mankind, which includes each and every one of us. And that is why it is just but logical that at that last hour of our Lord hanging on the cross, He gives us an another gift besides already redeeming us from our sins. He gives us that last gift of a mother of really connecting Our Lady intimately to us, personally. Not only is Our Lady now a participant in the redemptive mission of Jesus, of saving us from our sins, but Our Lady now is even given to us to really be our own mother. Not only His, but our own mother. So what does what do we what do we get from from all of this recollection and 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 uh, contemplation of these gospel scenes and today's feast? Besides, but well, two things. One is you know, sorrows will be part of life, right? And you better you better uh, be convinced of that. That life is not a bed of roses. There will be ups and downs. There will be times when our Lord will allow us to participate in His own suffering, in His own cross, as we talked about it yesterday. But the consolation is, we have a mother who understands us. We have a mother who has gone through many more difficult trials than we have and we perhaps would have all throughout our life. I think nothing compares to the kind of sorrows that Our Lady had. And so she understands us and she will understand us. So I think a big lesson here is let's learn to take recourse to Our Lady. Let us learn to really make Our Lady an intimate, intimate part of our daily lives. So those little crosses, those little things that we experience, little difficulties, little challenges, little annoyances right? that, that uh, we experience in our everyday lives, the inconveniences that, uh, that we go through 
especially those things that we did not concoct ourselves, those that are being imposed upon us, you know. Uh, let's, let's learn to turn to Our Lady and ask Our Lady, Mother, help me go through this. Mother, help me take this well. Mother, help me to accompany Jesus. Help me to turn this little difficulty, this little challenge, into my own participation into Jesus' cross. See? I want to be as strong as you, my mother, who, who stood by our Lord's cross and never abandoned Him, to, even at the last minute. Help me to have that kind of strength to go through this little difficulty I'm experiencing now, this little challenge I'm experiencing now. Please accompany me. Stand with me. Stand with me as I face this cross that our Lord wants me to face. I'm looking at this cross like I am looking at Jesus. I'm carrying this cross that God has allowed me to, to, to experience and go through in life. And I want to meet you along the way like Jesus did. Right? And as that book, as that book we're reading for the Rosary says, authored by uh, Saint Jose Maria Escriva, right? If you carry your cross, uh, carry it with love, right? Not with resignation, not with not by dragging your feet, right? But carry it squarely on your shoulders, and love your cross, because if you carry it so, your cross will be. A cross without a cross. Because our Lord is going to be carrying it with you and for you. And, and if you're close to Our Lady, you're also going to meet Our Lady on the way. The same way that Jesus met Our Lady on His way to Calvary. See? So beautiful, beautiful things to contemplate and to think about every time that we uh, go through challenges and difficulties and sorrowful experiences in our lives. You see, that is why, you know, folks, that is why for a Catholic, the, the, the mystery, the mystery of Catholic cheerfulness and joy is really something difficult for non-Catholics to appreciate and to understand. You know, many times, uh, our separated brethren, they, they, they think we're, we're foolish. They think we Catholics are foolish because we, we don't sulk when we are experiencing sorrows and, and, and challenges in life. We, 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 if we know how to take these things properly and supernaturally, by the way, that's what I've been wanting to say. We Catholics know how to take on the crosses of life, cheerfully, because like Our Lady, we understand that there is a supernatural value to all of this. There's a supernatural value. That difficulties, challenges, sorrows in life are not there as obstacles and not there just to make life difficult for us. And they're not there because God hates us. No. Uh, of course, this is a topic for another consideration. But what I'd like us to understand in, in connection with today's feast is that if we look at our sorrows in life from the perspective of supernatural vision, okay, from the perspective of the, of, of the supernatural value of these sufferings, then there is no room for gloominess in the life of a Catholic, in the life of a Christian. Of course we feel sorrow. You think Our Lady was not sorrowful, right? But it is not a sorrow that leads to depression. It is not a sorrow that leads to sadness that is insurmountable. No. For us, Catholics, with supernatural faith, with supernatural vision, our sorrows can be turned into joy, 
can be turned into a source of hope, can be turned into a, into a source of manifestate, manifesting faith in God and in the providence of God. See? So even in the face of very challenging, difficult, and real sad events in our lives, we can actually experience the mystery of happiness, of joy, combined with these sorrows. Okay? That's, the, that's the mystery that really anybody who does not have a supernatural outlook will not understand. Because that only happens, that can only be enjoyed by a true faithful Christian who knows how to put all of these sorrows uh, within the perspective of its supernatural value. Okay? The supernatural redemptive value that we learned from the cross. To a lot of people, the cross is a symbol of defeat. For a lot of people, the cross is a symbol of death and the end of a promise. Not for us. For Catholics, for Christians with real faith, the cross is a symbol of victory. Because it's a symbol of redemption. It was there on that cross that we were redeemed from our sins. Okay? The cross is actually the trophy. See? The cross is the path to redemption and to glory, to the resurrection, and to life everlasting in heaven. See? That is what the cross is for us. And Our Lady knew that and viewed it in the same way with supernatural vision. And that is what enabled her to go through all of these sorrows of her own life in a, in, a, in a manner that later brought her all the joys and happiness that these sorrows uh, provided. See? In every sorrow, there is joy. But we need to understand it with a supernatural vision okay that's it for us so we we got a little uh long-winded today in overtime so sorry for that it's time for mass okay let's go to mass have a good day everybody see you again tomorrow hopefully bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.